Thank you uh, all for being here today. I think we've got a very exciting panel to uh, follow the keynote. Uh, my name is Jason Shepard, um, and it's an honor for me to be back here in Madison today. Uh, I'm a, a badger at heart, uh, and I know a lot of people in this room. Uh, I worked as a journalist for the Capital Times in Isthmus uh, for about a, a, a decade, uh, and I also have my bachelor's degree, master's degree, and doctorate from uh, the School of Journalism and Mass Communication here. Uh, today I'm an associate professor of communications at California State University Fullerton, where uh, I teach courses in media law and journalism innovations. And much of my academic research has examined journalist source protections. Uh, it actually all began uh, more than a decade ago uh, in my, my research began uh, more than a decade ago uh, my, in the first semester of my uh, graduate studies here in Professor Bob Drexel's media law seminar. Uh, and 10 years later, I've published a number of, of articles in a book about journalist privilege law. The, the three panelists uh, who I will introduce in a moment will discuss ways in which the new surveillance environment that we find ourselves in today affects the ethics of protecting sources and data. Today, journalists covering national security in particular face a, a perilous environment, mass surveillance, secret and ambiguous laws, aggressive leak investigations, and prosecutions and jailings of those who provide information to journalists. I worry that we are witnessing the start of a long-term shift that will hurt journalists' ability to get critical information from government sources. And without confidential sources, I wonder how little we as citizens are going to know about our national security apparatus. So among the questions that I think some of our panelists will discuss today are how have government tactics changed uh, in recent years to unmask leakers and journalist sources? What has caused some of these changes? How are news organizations and journalists responding to these new threats and how should they? How are journalists able to develop and cultivate sensitive sources in today's environment? How should journalists encourage potential sources and themselves uh, to avoid technologies and methods of communication that may put them at risk of discovery? And when is such collusion between journalists and source crossing an ethical line for, for journalists? So the three panelists are quite distinguished and I'm looking forward to hearing their comments. We'll, we'll begin today with Marissa Taylor, who is an investigative reporter with McClatchy, DC. And she will talk a little about her own reporting uh, uh, on government attempts to investigate potential leakers through the government's insider threat program and other efforts. Uh, second, we'll hear from Jonathan Stray, who is a journalist and computer scientist. Uh, and also a fellow at the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia University. And Jonathan will talk a little about ways in which journalists can think about and plan for these new surveillance and security threats. And finally, uh, Brant Houston, professor uh, uh, and the Knight Foundation Chair in Investigative and Enterprise Reporting uh, at the University of Illinois will discuss why leakers leak and how investigative reporters struggle with the ethics and challenges of working with whistleblowers and leakers. So it is my uh, honor to first uh, introduce uh, Marissa Taylor. Hi, um, thanks uh, for being here. Um, just um, the conversation already has um, made me think that um, actually there might be a little interest in um, just this, um, uh, the idea that there was a lot of focus in Eric's uh, speech about national security, and in my experience as a reporter who, uh, I was a, a local reporter um, in the Southwest and, and before I went to DC in 2006, and then I covered the Justice Department um, at the end of the Bush uh, administration, beginning of the Obama administration, and now I've been covering intelligence and defense issues as an in investigative reporter with McClatchy, and you know, in my experience, um, this the scrutiny isn't only about uh, classified information. Um, you know, at this point, um, recently, uh, the, the uh, director of national intelligence uh, just issued 
um, a, direct, a directive to um, intelligence um, agencies that, that all officials um, cannot talk to reporters unless um, authorized about um, anything. It doesn't have to be classified information. Um, and, um, you know, at a time when, uh, you know, post Snowden, when uh, the administration talked about how it is interested in being more transparent in reaction to the fact that uh, there was concern there should have been more public debate about these issues before uh, Snowden. Uh, at a time when, when the administration has said it is trying to be more transparent, there actually are uh, rather aggressive efforts that make it harder for, the, for government officials to be transparent um, and talk about a policy issue talk about unclassified matters. Um, one of the things that a colleague of mine and I wrote about um, is this program called the Insider Threat Program. Um, it, it's actually something that, is, um, that uh, was sort of quietly um, um, instituted uh, post Manning um, and, and pre-Snowden when uh, President Obama signed an executive order that all ordered all, uh, it, most agencies, um, including non-intelligence um, and um, non-law enforcement agencies, to start up insider threat programs um, designed to look at uh, federal employees who might leak, um, but it also included a, a wide range of other um, potential um, threats that the government might be concerned about. Um, actually, the Defense Department um, in its own strategy that we, we got a copy of, um, and it was not classified, um, it said, um, hammer this fact home. Leaking is tantamount to aiding the enemies of the United States. Um, so the, you know, it's one thing to talk about classified information and the debate over whether, you know, are you the, the, an enemy of the United States, like the argument about Snowden, you know, it, should he be prosecuted? Um, when it entails classified information. It's another when um, now um, leaks are being equated with unclassified information, also very low um, uh, levels of classified information, like confidential information. Um, and um, also there's a sort of a broad uh, definition of what a threat to national security could be. Um, the Pentagon um, has described um, a, a possible insider threat employee as someone who is wittingly or unwittingly harming national security interests through unauthorized disclosure, data modification, espionage, terrorism, or kinetic actions resulting in loss or degradation of resources or capabilities. Now that's very broad, um, and in fact, one Pentagon official told us that that, that could include any kind of possible suspect of a crime. Um, that, that could include all sorts of things. Um, and then there's this um, idea that, you know, it's one thing um, for intelligence agencies to talk about security and protecting um, its own agent, their own agencies from leaks, but it's another for the Peace Corps to, to now talk about um, having its own security division root out um, insider threats, and that's exactly what is being encouraged. The Department of Education tells employees that coworkers going through certain life experiences might turn a trusted in user into an insider threat. Those in experiences include divorce, um, stress, uh, financial problems. Um, and the FBI described an insider threat as someone who um, has a desire to help the underdog. Um, now, I don't think every and federal employee is going to take all of these definitions very seriously, but there are a lot of federal employees with security clearances in this country at this point. Um, that's another shift that's occurred since 9-11. Uh, we now have more classified information, more people with security clearances. Those people are the very people who potentially could be informing us about uh, some of these things that we want to know about that are not classified. Um, there is an argument, I think, um, that now um, that many people inside the, the administration um, are conceding that, that perhaps there should have been an, 
an unclassified debate about NSA um, before um, the Snowden le leaks. And now we're, you know, now we have basically have, are having one uh, because of Snowden. Um, and so I think there's a concern that in the effort to control what is extremely difficult to control, which is this mass of information that the government now has, classified information, sensitive information, confidential information, um, it's all um, in vast uh, databases, and now we have almost five million people with security clearances who have access to this information who have to, um, who undergo um, scrutiny through either these programs or leak investigations. And it, ha it has the potential of having a, a chilling effect. These, this kind of scrutiny has a, a potential of having a ch chilling effect on um, not only our ability as reporters to, um, <laughs> to inform the public, but also um, there's a concern that um, some of this scrutiny, if, if, not, if, if it's unchecked, um, could impact whistleblowing. Um, and that uh, already um, intelligence agencies are not known for having the strongest whistleblowing um, programs. And this administration has said that it uh, wishes to improve that. Well, you know, I recently reported on how uh, the whistleblower advocate who's supposed to be in implementing the reforms, the very reforms that this administration um, thinks will help improve these, these programs, um, they're trying to take away his security clearance. Um, and it's because he was suspected of something that, you know, they don't, I'm not even sure there is any evidence that, that he did something. Um, so I think that, that it is an interesting shift that really has a lot to do with 9-11. Um, just briefly, I was a reporter um, before 9-11, and I actually was the subject of a, uh, of a leak in investigation before 9-11. And before 9-11, um, you know, these things weren't really taken very seriously. I mean, I, I actually was called by the agency that was do doing the leak investigation, and they said, are you going to give us your sources? I said, no, and they said, thank you very much, and that was it. Um, obviously, things have changed, and I, I think that there, um, I think there's legitimate concern that, um, that in the effort, in the, in the, a legitimate effort to try to control information that is classified, um, that the government um, uh, is, is potentially um, going overboard. Thank you very much. We'll uh, now turn to Jonathan. And a microphone, I hope. So I'm going to try to give you a little context for maybe some things that we can do to help reclaim a little bit of this lost ability. And what I see as the fundamental thing that we've lost is the ability to have a private communication electronically. Now, arguably, this never really existed, but Privacy is not an absolute, it's about expectations. And before perhaps 15 years ago, uh, it was possible to expect that you could have a phone call or even uh, a secure online communication uh, and believe that probably you were going to be okay. Nobody was going to know about that communication, nobody could, would be able to see the contents of it. Probably nobody would even know that you were having that communication. That, uh, that is the fundamental shift in, in power that we are seeing. Uh, a number of uh, large governments, notably the United States, are very interested in ensuring that that is not a thing that humans can do. Um, but there are some interesting asymmetries here. One of them is the asymmetry between code making and code breaking. And one of the things we have learned from the NSA files is that um, in many specific instances, encryption technology is not breakable by the NSA. Unfortunately, protecting a source is a lot more about encryption technology, and honestly, the outlook isn't great. But having said that, here's a, a very brief introduction to computer security, and I hope you will join me this afternoon when we go into it in a little more depth. 
So these are the sorts of problems we're looking at. Um, this is a case where a failure of computer security or information security could lead to someone's death, and possibly did. Right? We, don't, we don't really know what happened in this case. Um, that might be a little far from home for the people in this room. I don't know how many of you are involved in conflict reporting, but certainly reporting on war security has always been a problem. Here's something maybe a little closer to home, uh, especially um, because it actually concerns my, my employer. Um, now, nobody died, but uh, it did cause uh, a stock market crash when the AP's Twitter account was hacked. Um, it recovered within a few minutes, but you know, this is alarming, right? This is, this is um, the AP is known for many things, and one of them is, is, is a sterling reputation for accuracy, and this affects that. So we have this spectrum of reasons why we need information security. And there are a bunch of them, right? It's, it's of course, our commitments to sources. Um, you heard in the keynote about making promises to sources and negotiating what was going to be revealed and what sort of protection we could offer them. And we make commitments to sources all the time. Of course, it's unethical to make commitments that we can't keep. Uh, but there's all of these other, other things, ranging from uh, the safety of, your, of not just your sources, but the journalists, uh, all the way to your reputation or your ability to operate. If you have bad security and someone gets into your network and deletes all your, your drafts of your story, you may not be able to operate at all. I have sort of three parts to this. Um, I'm going to try to do the really, really fast version of uh, convincing you that you have this problem even if you're not a national security reporter. And the reason for that is that uh, if I'm trying to get to a specific person in your news organization, I can go through the weakest link. So what's the weakest link? Well, um, bad passwords. Here's real data from two password breaches. Uh, 123456 remains the most popular password on most services. Uh, I, I won't do a show of hands uh, and ask how many people have a password on this list. Uh, but I'm guessing it's more than zero. So standard password advice, right? Um, don't use a word in the dictionary. Don't use any information that someone could guess from knowing you. you know, don't use your date of birth. Don't use your son's name all of this stuff, your uh, pet's name, none of that. Um, so basic password advice, right? Use a good password. Um, Two-factor authentication, I, I think I have that on a slide, there we go. Um, this is getting easier and easier to use. Uh, there's no excuse for journalists not to be using two-factor authentication. Journalists are, uh, relatively speaking, in a high-risk profession. We are targets. We are targets all over the world. This is something very easy that you can do to ensure that even if someone does get your password, they're not able to use it. And most services now support two-factor authentication. I recommend particularly on your email, because if I can get your email, I can get every other password using password reset. And you can't use the same password on every site. Uh, the simple reason for that is Again, it's about the weakest link. If they can break security on one site, they can break security on all of these sites. Uh, to help make that easier, there's software that you can use that helps manage your passwords across all your various devices, and I would recommend that as well. I also have to talk about phishing. It's very hard to know exactly how journalists are getting compromised, but my guess is that phishing is the most common method. My guess is something uh, I would say a clear majority of the cases that I hear about start with a journalist clicking on a link that they should have. Now, phishing used to look like this, you know, very obviously a, a forged email, and it used to try to get you to type in a login. Now it looks like this. The, um, the rogue tweet that we saw, that was done like this. Uh, that, a group called the Syrian Electronic Army took um, responsibility for that. Whenever I say that, I think that should be the name of an experimental music group, right? Like, man, I went to see the Syrian Electronic Army last night. They were amazing. Um, but it's not. It's a group that actually does fairly serious attacks on uh, 
journalists and activists uh, worldwide, actually. And they did it through a forged email. Uh, so this is an email that an AP staffer received. It looks like it came from a colleague of theirs. It didn't. They had compromised that colleague uh, and then sent this email using that compromised account. So you can sort of bootstrap up the weakest link to gain accounts and privileges that make you look more and more legitimate. And basically, the way this game works is, if I can get you to click on a link, I win. So that means whenever you receive an electronic communication that has a link in it, you have to ask, where does it go? And in particular, read the URL that it goes to. Again, I'll talk about this a lot more. So I would be negligent if I didn't mention passwords and phishing. Um, with that out of the way, we're going we're to get to the heart of the matter here. Um, oh yeah, here's, here's phishing. So this phishing has now evolved into spear phishing, which is targeted attacks. So not just blast of emails, but I now learn something specific about you. Maybe I learn what you're working on, and I send you an email and say, hey, that story you were doing on the thing, I have some information, um, check this out. Um, and the, the bad news is there is no technological fix to this. As long as we have links, phishing will always work. Because phishing is not a technological hack. It is an exploitation of social trust, ultimately. And so one of the themes that's going to keep coming up is there is no clear divide between digital security and just security. You can't separate the world into online and offline components. And decisions about who to trust with what are going to be relevant no matter what technology we have. Uh, if you only have time for thinking about two things, uh, I would say uh, phishing and passwords, and then this. This is, this is the key slide. Mostly when people come to me and they ask me about digital security, they want me to recommend tools. They want technological help. There is no tool that can solve the security problem. Now, there are tools that might be parts of the solution, but it depends on your circumstance. So we can't even have the conversation about what tools or technology you should be using without having the conversation about what your security problem is. And these are the questions to help you think through it. One of the things that you'll notice on this slide is um, what can they do includes things like subpoena or exploit trust. Again, uh, your threat model has to include all the possible attacks, not just the technical attacks, which are for some reason very glamorous and everybody likes to think about them. They have a sort of mystique, right? But uh, Talking to someone you shouldn't talk to or getting subpoenaed can be just as devastating and is often easier for your adversary. So we'll run through a bunch of, of scenarios this afternoon to try to get you thinking about this. Uh, here's one. Um, so this was the, for example, could have been the threat model for the, uh, the journalist who had their laptop stolen in Syria, right? Or, I, or for a photojournalist who wants to get uh, images home. There are journalists who have this, this uh, problem right now. And we'll go through a bunch of these with different adversaries. Uh, here's another one. Um, very often your adversary isn't a government, but the subject of the story. So how would you protect against a corporate adver adversary? What a bank can do and what a police department can do are very different. So you're going to need different types of protection and different types of procedures. And once you have a threat model, then you start to have to ask, well, how do we protect against it? That, that's where the technical knowledge starts to be necessary. So for example, there's a distinction between data at rest and data in motion. If I'm sending a photograph back to my editor, that's data in motion and I need to protect that communication. If I have that photograph on a memory card in my camera or stored on my laptop, that's data at rest. And then I need different types of techniques. I have to start talking about things like encrypting my drive. And so once you understand what you're protecting and, and who you're protecting it from and what they can do, then you have to ask, how does that intersect with the technical specifics? 
of how the internet works and how communications work. And then there's things like mobile security. Uh, phones are a security disaster. They are, uh, first of all, they are location tracking devices. They have very, very well established metadata streams and data retention policies. That is to say, who I talk to is recorded by the phone company, and it may, be st it may stay in that database for years. Um, there's a great animation, which I'll show this afternoon, which is a, a German politician uh, requested and got from their phone company a record of uh, their location history for the previous year. And so there's this beautiful little animation of exactly where they were, and correlating that against their press releases, their tweets, their public appearances, you knew exactly where this guy was and where he went and who he met with and in which bar. And in fact, because you have the location data for everybody, theoretically, you can track every person I've met with. Uh, we know that uh, the intelligence community is already doing this. There was a story recently about exactly this type of location correlation. Is that a problem for you? It depends. So once we go through all of that, we can get down to the granular technique. So for example, uh, OTR, which stands for off the record, is a plugin for many instant messaging systems that will do secure encrypted messaging. Provided uh, you're doing it right, and provided uh, it's a problem you actually have. Um, so that's why my talk about security always start, talk, starts at a much higher level. But we'll go through those higher levels, and then we'll talk about specific the last thing I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to, since this is an ethics conference, I'm going to take a stab at the ethics of source protection. Um, all of this is a proposal. Um, I couldn't find a lot of, of sort of pre-existing thinking on this point, so I'm going to suggest some. So here's where I start. Uh, this was the only ethical principle that I was fairly certain of, which is the principle of risk assumption. I can decide to assume risk for myself. I can't decide to assume risk for someone else. Fault. Starting from this point, we get a bunch of interesting implications. So there, there's another basic problem that we have in journalism, which is I can't decide to assume risk for someone else, but most commonly, I know a lot more about security than the source does, which means I'm in the position of advising them on what they should do. This is a fundamental conflict because they're going to ask me how to protect themselves, and I'm gonna to have to tell them because usually there's no one else, which puts me in the position of having uh, additional responsibility for, and in fact, making choices and trade-offs about acceptable risks and possible outcomes, right? So it's, it's not simply I go to a source and I say, you know, uh, let's talk, do you want to do this? Um, tell me what you know, and they are a fully empowered, informed, competent uh, individual who knows how to protect their, their security and to make choices. That is almost never the case. The relationship is maybe closer to uh, a lawyer or a healthcare professional or some situation where there is a pronounced asymmetry of knowledge and capability, which means to some extent you have to. You have to assume responsibility for the security of your sources. You can't get away from it. This is bad news. So here are my principles. I start with do no harm because it's very easy to fuck this up, right? It's, it's incredibly easy um, to get this wrong. And it's not just about, you know, I didn't install the software correctly. It's things like operational security. Not only do I have to have the tools, I have to use them right. And I have to use them right every time. If I create a new anonymous online identity, that online identity can never send a message to my non-anonymized identity. In fact, I can't even ever mention both of those identities in the same message. Anything that links them will blow that anonymity. Um, I, I heard this morning about a case where a source was revealed because they had years old text messages stored on their phone. 
So it's not just about installing the right software, it's about developing secure habits. And that's hard. And it's so easy to get wrong that in many cases, I don't even go there. I, I don't give people, um, well I give people security advice all the time. I don't give people who have specific risks security advice unless I'm very sure that I can't get them into trouble doing it. Uh, because I think that would be worse. Um, informed consent. Uh, if someone is going to take a risk, I need to make sure they understand what the risk is. Now risk is not an absolute, risk is always subjective. What am I willing to tolerate? What do I stand to gain by taking this risk? That's not a choice that I can make for a source. That's a choice that they have to make, but it means that they have to understand something about the risk. And so that's an area where I feel that we as journalists have responsibility to sources to help them understand what does all of this entail. And the last thing I want to talk about is it is not enough to solve the journalism source protection problem. In fact, it's not a solvable problem. It's only a solvable problem if we solve the general secure communication problem. And the reason for that is the use of secure technologies can be a flag. That can be a giveaway. If I don't need to know what you said, but I just need to know that you are trying to say something to a journalist that you want to keep private, that might be enough in many circumstances. Um, so we heard this morning um, uh, that uh, an argument that journalists should take a political stand around uh, surveillance and security. And I agree, I think that's true. I think we, uh, and not just you know, we as journalists and we as journalism ethics people, but we as uh, a global civilization are at a crossroads where we're, we're deciding, will it be permissible to have private electronic communication? And if the answer to that turns out to be no, then there's not a lot that we as journalists are going to be able to do because if it's difficult or unusual to have secure communication, that itself will reveal our sources. So these are, these are what I think the implications of these principles. If you accept these principles, this is where I think it leads us. And unfortunately, it's not simple or easy. It means that we have to be tremendously well informed. It means that we have, like it or not, the role of teaching our sources about what we know and about how to stay secure. And it means that realistically, if we're serious about this, we have to take the position uh, of advocates for the ability to have a private electronic conversation. So those are my proposals. Um, I hope that you will um, join me this afternoon when we get uh, into a little more detail about this. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, next and last, we'll turn to uh, Bryant Houston, who uh, will conclude the remarks, and then we'll open it up for questions. OK, can you hear this OK? All right, good. It's got turned on. Um, uh, a couple of notes I just wanted to make before I get into a little bit more of the presentation. One is, I, Jonathan's made excellent points. There is a conference every year that has a lot about uh, protecting sources and source cultivation investigative reporters and editors. It's every June. Most of uh, the material gets posted there, so I would commend that to you as a way to follow up. Uh, because this is a, a long time struggle and game that's been going on. Um, it's gotten more complicated with the digital world, but a lot of the questions that Jonathan's brought up is um, something I struggled with when I was reporting and there's just a lot of, uh, a lot of hard copy. Um, I did want to offer the Gordian Knot solution that Cy Hirsch, who's done a lot of security reporting and um, others have suggested, which is get offline and, uh, and go to a parking garage, preferably the sixth level, uh, because it's hard for the beams to get down there and, the, uh, and, and to find where you are and don't take your phone. Um, that is actually something I've heard Seymour Hirsch talk about. Uh, he does not keep notes electronically. There are stacks and stacks of notebooks. Um, he's extreme on this. He can't understand why anyone would type a story on a computer. 
uh, because somebody could read the computer. And that's the extreme, extreme example. Um, also, other uh, reporters have talked about basically get the story done and immediately throw away your notes, which becomes another ethical issue, but just get rid of them. So when you're subpoenaed, you don't have them. Uh, so there are a lot of, um, a, a lot of possible solutions. Um, one other thing that reporters suggest is becoming so knowledgeable that no one ever wants to subpoena you because everyone's turned into a source. I suspect a lot of the experienced reporters have done that. Another suggestion has been, well, if you've got to go electronic, then you might as well get into the game of disinformation and avatars. I've had many people suggest you might as well have five or six identities if you're going to be online and let them figure out which ones seem to work. So um, a lot of this then moves into the ethics of uh, doing undercover work. Basically, you're not who you are anymore. What I really wanted to talk about are two other things, though, which is we're talking about national security. Uh, a lot of things are ha happening at a very high, important level. But we're not touching on the existence of the state fusion centers, which are a part of the national security fabric and which allows local enforcement, regional enforcement, state enforcement access to a lot of material. And I would suggest today that it would be good for us to turn our attention back to what's going on with these state fusion centers. I know if you're familiar about them, I'm going to post some links to studies, evaluations, and other reports on them. I know Chris is uh, definitely familiar with. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about, though, was really how to deal with sources whether it's digital or not, and to recognize what kind of source you have. And this gets into protecting both the source and yourself, whether it's digital. So I have categories for whistleblowers and leakers and sources. And they, I've divided them up into a few, inspired by another reporter, Mike Barron. Um, the first kind of leaker whistleblower we can run into is the true believer or idolog. I think at times that can be the most dangerous leaker whistleblower or source because they've gotten to the point that they've made a moral and ethical decision that they really don't care what happens. And if they draw you into that world, you're going to have to be very, very careful. A second one that's equally uh, worrisome is the avenger. This is the passed over angry person, and generally they live angry. Uh, they also will take things past the limit. Uh, three that's a little trickier are the ones I call mischief makers. And they are really having fun in the digital world. They will send out a false email. They'll uh, screw up a report. Uh, they just want to cause trouble. That makes their day. Uh, the safer ones I like, and I think Jonathan was alluding to some of those, are the reluctants. Those who are reluctantly but feel ethically that they have to say something. They have to bring it across. Those are a little bit easier to deal with because it's a slower process and you have a little more control over it. Um, the ones you can read right away usually are the political operatives. And so they are leaking or allegedly whistleblowing to throw uh, some dirt on somebody else. Uh, then there are the ones also complicated, but you have to take them into account, which are the bureaucratic infighters. That leak or the blowing of the whistle will eliminate somebody they're in competition with, and they'll be allowed to move into that position or you'll get them out of your way. Um, and the last ones, which are very interesting ethical um, problem to deal with, are the, what I call the CYAs. Those are the ones that are pointing the fingers at somebody else so you won't get to them. And I think that's where you have to be very careful with your promises and, um, and with how much you're going to protect them. I once had a source that uh, was probably one of the most horrible people I've ever dealt with, completely immoral, amoral. Um, and I had to promise him his information was good, but if he got indicted again, I would personally write the story. And he did, and I did. Um, so I thought that was a good promise to keep with him. But those are really difficult and um, uh, you know, moral issues we have to deal with. I think Jonathan um, made an excellent point in talking about that we, if we're even going to exist in journalists, we have to have levels of threat. We have to decide when we go to these extremes, because no one has any time to do all the stuff that you have to do maybe on national security or suggest if you're going to a state fusion center. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got about 20 minutes for questions. So. 
How, how uh, big an issue is data manipulation? A lot of journalists are going to files now, uh, downloading data, and uh, I, I have seen some data sources that I, I know are incorrect. Um, is data manipulation a growing issue? You know, one of my, my students is actually looking into this, this very question, um, and not only how big is an issue, which nobody really knows the answer to, unfortunately, but um, how to detect it. Um, if you have a, a particular example of, of manipulated data, I would, I would love to hear about it. Well, I, I think what we have to do is, it's the same thing, you hate a one source story when it comes to a person. Mm -hmm. I think you have to have multiple sources and data to understand manipulation or degradation or any of those things. I think it's uh, generally a little scary to work with just one database on any, any story. And you know, triangulation has kept us fairly safe in terms of credibility over the years, whether it's triangulation of human sources, data, documents, or all of them. Yeah, what he said, Th there has to be a non-technical answer, and that's the answer, get it from another source. One of, uh, one of the uh, practices that have, have arisen in various leak investigations, my question is for Marisa, is the use of encrypted software to communicate with uh, U.S. officials who have high-level security clearances. And my question is, is that okay from the point of view of citizenship? And if it's okay for an American journalist who enjoys First Amendment rights to, to do that, is it also okay for a non-American journalist, one, say, working for The Guardian, to engage in, in encrypted communication with a, an American intelligence official? Or, and if it's okay for The Guardian, is it okay for Haaretz? And if it's okay for Haaretz, is it okay for China's People's Daily? And I'm sorry, did you direct it to, to me? You did, yeah, yeah, she did. Um, and, well, I actually um, have mixed feelings about encrypted um, email in general, just because I don't think it protects anybody. I think that, that in the end, I, I think, yes, it protects them, um, as we know right now, that it, it, the code supposedly can't be broken, but I think I have sources who are um, reluctant to do it in the first place because then it implies guilt. And, you know, there is, now there's a legal definition of what a, a leaker is and, you know, was their intent. Um, and so I, I actually don't think encrypted email really helps us very much, unfortunately. Um, I think when you have to use it, I think that's, I think there is, you, ha you have to use it. I think there are times when you just have to do what you have to do in order to get the information, unfortunately. And, but I think it all goes back to Cy Hirsch and the fact that I think, I think we have to meet with people. Um, I think we have to, to, and then to get the data that we need for, if it's, if, you know, on, the Guardian faced this with, and, um, and Glenn Greenwald, you know, obviously he talks about how, um, you know, that encryption uh, is what, get, you know, helped him in the end. But I, you know, I think that's a, a very, a very imperfect solution. And I, I think at this point, ideally, um, if we're gonna protect people, um, I think the best way is to not even leave any kind of electri electronic trail whatsoever. Hi, yeah, um, I've got a question about um, uh, the New Yorker is using Aaron Schwartz's uh, strong box now as mm -hmm. kind of a way for people to get information to them in, in a fairly secure manner. Uh, do you see that expanding? Does it help provide the the expectation that people are getting their information through securely and you know at least relieves some of their doubts in that as well and do you see more even smaller news organizations start to move towards something like that as well yeah so the short answer is yeah i think it's useful i think that that technology is interesting um, and if you want to be in the business of accepting anonymous uh, submissions of material then that's probably the way to go. Um, having said that, it's a bit of a niche case that it solves. The problem it solves is moving a bunch of material, or even just a message, because it has a little messaging interface, um, between a source and a journalist or a news organization such that the 
journalist does not know the identity of the source. So this is a, a theory of, of leaking that says, well, maybe the way you protect the source is you just never know who they are. Um, and if that works, great. Um, unfortunately, the only sort of big example of that we have is the WikiLeaks material where the source then uh, told someone else that they were the source. So it, it's useful that you can offer that capability if, if you believe that you can do useful journalism just based on the material that you are given. Um, again, that, that really speaks, that, that is possible only if you have another way to verify the authenticity of that material, which you often do. But how often does that actually happen, right? The, the, uh, the big leaks that we've seen in recent years have perhaps uh, made us believe that that is more common than it actually is. Much more common is um, just good old fashioned journalism, talking to somebody that you know. And protecting those communications is unfortunately much harder because you already have a history of contact. About the problems involved in celebrity journalism and those, so those journalists who are especially known, uh, sources shop around very often for a journalist and are there certain problems in dealing with somebody who has a, a, a known a set of uh, issues uh, that he or she has been working on and definitely uh, perhaps problems with authority figures that may be worked out in your case rather than in a previous case. Again, the celebrity journalist. And I'm sorry, that you, you mean that the, the journalist is a celebrity journalist? So having a more celebrity uh, footprint, uh, wider uh, uh, notoriety uh, than another journalist. Uh, if I were a source, should I come out to somebody who is uh, perhaps less well known than somebody who would be a target, uh, him or herself, uh, with issues far beyond my own personal case. Well, as a non-celebrity journalist, I'd like to say I welcome anybody <laughs> coming to me instead of a celebrity journalist. And, and, Bo I, and Bob Woodward would, would say you should have gone to him. <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think that I, I, it's interesting to watch the um, Snowden situation because I think um, you know I just. I, I wonder, um, you know, it would be interesting to know what kind of security Glenn Greenwald <laughs> has at this point. Because he, uh, obviously he's under a lot of scrutiny now. Um, and, um, I, but on the other hand, I, I, and I'm not sure that that's, um, and I don't know how, what that would, would entail, but I think that perhaps he's, he's um, uh, exercising the Cy Hirsch um, <laughs> rule now, too. Um, well, one of his best defenses is every time he's attacked, he holds the mirror up to it. And journalists in the past have been reluctant, or editors, to say we're being abused or attacked or whatever. And Glenn Greenwald, it's like it's news every time he's attacked. So that's made it pretty interesting uh, in terms of the playing field, right? That's, and it's something w we wouldn't necessarily do, but that's Glenn's story. Right, and I think it's a, it, it has, I think the Snowden um, case has really made a lot of journalists very uncomfortable. It's very hard to talk about, um, you know, this whole idea is Snowden, is, Snowden was a source, and, and yet, you know, we're, here we're talking about, you know, we're having to write stories about, should, you know, is he, should he be prosecuted? I mean, it is a really conflicted role we have right now with, with and also with WikiLeaks. You know, WikiLeaks, um, you know, they dumped all the, this, all of these documents that we all went through and we found stories for, and yet, um, you know, potentially they could be prosecuted too. Um, and, you know, and there's this debate about, you know, are they traitors? <laughs> you know, it's a very di difficult um, position for um, practicing journalists to, to then say, you know, then engage in this debate. And, and I think that's what, um, I think, Eric's uh, speech also reflected that conflict, that it's very difficult to actually talk about what we do and, and then also um, talk about our sources. And I think, unfortunately, right now, that's what we're having to do. Well, we had to do it with Daniel Ellsberg. I mean, the, this will come up. I think 
you know, what makes investigative reporting so interesting is that we have this, uh, we, we have this challenge of saying, we're reporting the story, it's based on the source, and when the source comes out, then we've gotta go with the fact of what they did. And in the end, really, the principle is, does the outcome um, justify everything that's gone on before? It's the same thing that comes with undercover work, surveillance work, if the result overwhelms the methodology, we feel pretty good about it. If it doesn't, we don't feel good about it at all. And, that's, and that means that we're always in the struggle. There's no, there's no way around it, I, I think. I'm gonna just uh, interrupt and ask sort of a follow-up, if I, if I can, to, to Marissa and Brant. Do you have any sense of um, whether sources right now are shopping around for that celebrity journalist who might be able to both protect them and get the story out, or are more leaks and stories about them the result of journalists who have developed and cultivated relationships with people over a period of time? And so the, the, the story is the result of that you know, relationship of trust that has been built up. I, I think like everything, I think it's both. I think that I think that there are probably people who are interested in, um, and you know, it's not it's not really celebrity. They're interested in getting their message out. You know, there's a it's sort of you know when Snowden identified himself, I, I had this thought of this. You know, now we're seeing leaking as civil diso disobedience. This is how Snowden describes himself. It's it's it was an act of civil disobedience. Um, you know, it can be prosecuted. Um, I think that that in, it's not really about celebrity journalism. It's about this this um, you know both WikiLeaks and Snowden um, had they both had enormous amounts of documents that that the mainstream press didn't have, um, and that's a very new development. That they were they were they had the power to then determine who to give it to um, and, and when to release it. And, and in fact, there was some pressure being put on, on some journalists about you're not, really, you know, you're not writing this fast enough. <laughs> um, so I think it's a really, um, I think yet at the same time, there is still kind of that traditional journalism that everybody's doing all, you know, even the people who get the documents. The, and, yeah, and the difference we have now is they, have the power to decide who to give it to, but they also have the power to publish it. And that's changed the game enormously. And I think that, so sometimes it's out of your hands and it's more in an environment of publish first then filter, whereas journalists uh, tend to filter then publish. Uh, I think we've been sued a lot more than people knew on the beat. Uh, a few lawsuits will probably change some of those standards, but but the, the game has changed in that way. Um, I think a, a working journalist feels more, much more comfortable with a source that's cultivated because you've gotten to know them a lot better. That's why I was saying the reluctance are a little, feel a little better because you've gotten to know them, you know their motivations, you know their risk better. Uh, and so it may be you get information both ways, but I think in the end when we're putting a story together, we like it better if we've gotten to know them. And I, actually, there's a great example of, um, of being burned by sources who were real sources. You, know, you can have real sources who burn you and give you fake information. And that 60 Minutes um, uh, a while back um, got information about um, border corruption. Um, and they had documents that, um, that, that were given to them by customs. They were real customs officials. And, um, and so they were able to verify their identity and unfortunately they were not on, uh, uh, able to identify the documents um, uh, as legitimate and it turned out that the employees completely faked the documents to prove their point, which was tr you know, the true. They, they, had a, a, um, it, they were trying to demonstrate that there's corruption uh, uh, at the US border, which is something that we know occurs. And, but they were really um, interested in, in proving it, so they fabricated documents. And, um, and so that, you know, that's something that, that you, we all have to be aware of with this, with now this um, access to, um, and, and who knows, maybe 
maybe we won't have another leak on the scale of WikiLeaks, but I have a feeling we will. <laughs> we have time for just maybe one, uh, one or two quick questions. Uh, I'm interested in getting, getting your thoughts on uh, surveillance at the corporate level. There's a lot of talk about government spying. There was an infamous case a few years ago where Hewlett Packard was trying to plug leaks from their boardroom and they launched a full scale sort of guerrilla operation. Their PR people and, and outside firms to track down the leaks. It included malware, phishing expeditions to, to ta target these journalists. Um, so, you know, we're dealing with PR folks all the time. How do we how do we protect communications? They send you a, a, a link, maybe for an innocuous story. Then you're doing a story that, that might involve sources. Are they, are, are they, uh, are they fishing there? Uh, how, how do you deal with, with that? You raised the insider trading case. Uh, uh, talk about that a little bit, if you would. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, great question. Um, in this country, uh, employers have the right to uh, monitor and retain all of the communications that you do at work. So that means in the course of performing your duties, using equipment that they own, all of it. So the easiest thing you can do is ask sources not to talk to you uh, from work, on work hours, or using work equipment. That would be my first and best piece of advice. That may not be enough um, because it's actually surprisingly hard to separate your communications into two streams. Um, people get tripped up over that all the time because it's so convenient, right? You just want to send that one IM and, um, you know, I'll meet you later tonight, right? And it, it depends. And also remember, to bust someone, you don't need to have, you know, the secret memo as an email attachment, right? That, that never happens, right? you need to have a suspect in your investigation. So the problem is even harder than keeping the confidential information out of the work log. The problem is, in many cases, hiding the fact that you're talking to someone at all. Yeah, our, our biggest challenge now is uh, people are trying to make it as illegal as possible to communicate, period. <laughs> Right, and so, and that, that's our biggest challenge. Right, so challenge that's, that's one of the civil Doesn't rights matter what they of communicate. The, of the 21st century. Can I have a private electronic communication? I'm glad you brought up corporate surveillance because it goes on much more than most reporters know. Um, and it also sets a reporter up for problems before publication because uh, torturous interference is always a really good legal uh, maneuver to try on somebody. And so. You know, about a decade and a half ago, it was our methods that came under scrutiny. It used to be you just wait around to publish and get sued for libel or malice or whatever. But we've got a whole other problem that has increased with the surveillance and with the communication and, system. And, yeah, and actually, the um, uh, many of the um, insider threat models that the government relies on are actually corporate. Um, they're used in the corporate environment as well. So the, and especially in the con now contracting is huge. So government contracting. I mean, those five million people who have security clearances, many of them are are um, government contractors. So it's sort of this quasi-private, public um, environment where you have a security clearance, you work for a private firm, um, and and that that firm ha has every right to, to spy on you also on behalf of the government because if you have a, because you have a security clearance. Well. It's also, um, uh, it's PR firms, in-house PR arms that are doing this, crisis communication firms, people that are dealing with journalists naturally anyway, who, who, uh, who have a access to us, basically. That's what happened with Hewlett Packard. Uh, with that, unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, so I'd like to thank our panelists for a very engaging discussion that I suspect will continue on throughout the rest of the day. Uh, so thank you guys very much for your uh, participation. We're going to uh, Switch gears here for a bit, 
and um, do the uh, Shadid Award. That was really a quick hour, wasn't it? it was a, we need more time. Uh, but to do that, I want to have Jack Mitchell come up. Uh, Jack is the chair of the committee that um, selected the, ran the contest and selected the winner. And so, Jack. I know that the worst way you can start a presentation is to say, as most of you already know, uh, but in fact, most of you do already know that Anthony Shadid graduated from the journalism program here at Wisconsin and went on to a very distinguished uh, career as a foreign correspondent in the Middle East. Uh, his coverage for the Washington Post, the New York Times, won not just one, but two Pulitzer Prizes in a very short uh, career. Throughout that time, he maintained his ties to Wisconsin and uh, served on the advisory board of the Center for Journalism Ethics and uh, took an active interest in, the, uh, in our activities and came in for meetings, etc. cetera. Uh, tragically, uh, Anthony Shadid died in, uh, on the Syrian border while trying to uh, uh, involved in being involved in coverage of the Syrian situation. And in honor of his interest in, uh, his, in the center, as well as his own you know, very high standard of journalism, we've named the award for journalism ethics uh, in his honor. Now, I had the privilege of chairing the committee this year that, uh, that selected our winner. And I have to say that it was an exhilarating experience. I, I can be as cynical as anybody maybe more cynical than most about, you know, the state of the profession and where it's going and those kinds of things. But looking at the applications that came in, it was really would restore the faith of anybody in what we do and what presumably we can do in the future. I would think H.L. Mencken would probably be inspired by, by this, although I'm not quite sure about that. Uh, but it was a really great experience. We had uh, entries from all kinds of uh, organizations, large and small, and from the very largest to some very small organizations, and every one of them uh, really had a good case to be made that they deserved uh, honor as, uh, uh, on this uh, category. But we had to choose one, and actually it turns out the choice was actually quite easy, and that was uh, the Associated Press and, uh, and three of its employees. So let me tell you briefly the story of, that we, we honored. Uh, more than, did I just make, yeah. I just hit this thing here, sure, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm not of this century, <laughs> as you may have guessed, so, well, more than uh, th three years ago, uh, while reporting the misdeeds of this in the CIA, the AP's Adam Goldman heard from a confidential source about a sensational story. An American who disappeared in Iran in 2007 on what the government always maintained was private business had actually been working for the CIA. Robert Levinson had been dispatched on an unauthorized intelligence gathering mission by rogue CIA analysts. <laughs> the CIA lied about its involvement to Congress, to the FBI, and to the White House. The CIA paid the Levinson family $2.5 million not to reveal the truth. And the public never knew about this. All the while, Levinson's fate, alive or dead, remained a mystery. The AP's first ethical task was to verify the Goldman source, what had been what they had been told. And three journalists at the AP took on this role. Uh, editor Ted Brightus, uh, Goldman himself, and reporter Matt Puzzo. Uh, and they were told to nail down these stories. Was it true? 
Their solid reporting included documents they obtained and reviewed and interviews with uh, current and former U.S. and foreign officials, including the rogue analysts themselves. But then became the really difficult issue. On four occasions after 2010, the AP approached the U.S. government officials at the various highest levels and told them of their intention to publish these stories. Three times, the government provided specific and persuasive reasons that revealing those true story of Levinson's mission would place his life in greater danger or disrupt the negotiations to free him. And three times, the AP agreed not to publish. From the beginning, the AP knew that other major news organizations were at work on the story, but they resisted the temptation to publish prematurely. Then, in late 2013, the AP's most senior editors deliberated among themselves for weeks before deciding it was time to reveal the truth. They advised Levinson's family and the government. Again, officials urged the AP not to publish, but this time, they could not point to any specific harm that would prevent the AP from publishing the truth. The Shadid Ethics Award Committee admired the enterprise of the AP in getting the facts nailed down on this situation when other organizations could not quite do so. But we respect even more the organization's sense of responsibility in holding a blockbuster story until its editors were confident that publication would not cause significant harm. We are pleased then to present the 2014 Anthony Shadid Ethics Award to reporters Adam Goldman, Matt Apuzo, and editor Ted Brightis of the Associated Press. And representing the three of them today is Mr. Brightis. There he is. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the AP and including our once in an era uh, reporting duo of Adam Goldman and Matt Apuzo, uh, thank you to the Center for Journalism Ethics. Uh, this is especially meaningful for us because we remember Anthony as uh, part of our AP family, uh, in addition to working for the Washington Post and New York Times. Uh, and significantly, uh, you know, we, we'd note that Bob Levinson has now been held captive for more than seven years and we continue to wish for his safe release to his wife and his family. Um, our story about Bob, as we came to call it, was singular in my 25 years of journalism. Uh, in conversations and debates with my bureau chief and AP's standards editor, our international editor, our general counsel, our managing editor, and our executive editor, uh, there was always one point that we agreed on. Uh, we could not remember a story like this. Uh, an ethically precarious, treacherous dilemma about whether, how, or when to run a story. Uh, this one involved lies, malfeasance, and the secret but unsanctioned government espionage mission inside Iran. And the question for us was whether publishing it would directly and specifically threaten to end Bob's life or extend his term as a hostage in a foreign land. There was talk earlier in the keynote when Eric uh, described conversations with the NSA about sort of theoretical risks. And this was different because Bob has a face uh, and his family had faces. And so this was always, always in our minds during these deliberations. Um, to this day, no one knows whether Bob is alive. Um, uh, as you heard, when, when uh, AP uh, sought fair comment from the government and explained our intention to publish the story. Uh, on three occasions over three years, AP was persuaded to hold the story uh, because we had this specific and articulable uh, persuasive reason describing why at the time revealing the true story of Bob's mission would either place his life in greater danger or disrupt some promising leads to find him or negotiate for his release. So uh, we, we made efforts to minimize harm. 
Uh, in the compressed news cycle that we're in, waiting, sitting on a story for three days uh, is, is tough. Sitting on a story like this for three years is a hair-pulling experience. Um, it, was just, it was just awful. Um, Matt has said it was, it was the, one of the hardest decisions uh, in his career. Um, as we waited, we knew that other news organizations were sniffing around. And during the same period, uh, we were writing sort of ancillary stories as each anniversary date would come up or there would be a photograph that leaked out about Bob in captivity. Uh, we, we were very careful to vet all of these stories about Bob's disappearance to be sure that we were not reporting anything that we knew not to be true. And this was, this was ethically very complicated for us. Uh, and it was, an, it was a mistake that other news organizations uh, were not so careful. Uh, during these three years, we did get sidetracked with some other big stories. Uh, Navy SEALs killed bin Laden, and Matt and Adam led the AP coverage of that. Uh, we did win the Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting uh, on another story for our examination in more than 40 stories of the NYPD surveillance of Muslims. Uh, and I have to say, when Eric described Congressman Pete King's description as a disgrace, the fact that the Snowden coverage won the Pulitzer this year, uh, he called our Pulitzer an absolute disgrace. So. <laughs> Uh, during the same period, we revealed that the CIA had foiled a plot, a secret Al-Qaeda plot, to blow up a Western airliner with a sophisticated new bomb. And we coped with the fallout from that reporting when the Justice Department seized our phone records without warning in a criminal leaks investigation, violating its own rules without consequence and in a breach of our constitutional rights. So how did we finally reach our decision to publish the story about Bob? Uh, last year, uh, uh, editors deliberated uh, and decided among ourselves that it was time to reveal the truth. This is what tipped the scales. Officials whom we trusted and who were directly involved in the negotiations uh, and in the case indicated privately to us that they were no longer concerned that publishing Bob's story would cause him greater harm. We became convinced that Iran knew full well about Bob's CIA ties. Time had elapsed since there had been any proof of life or any plausible efforts to locate him or negotiate for his release. Political changes in Iran suggested a lesser response to these revelations. But most importantly, we refocused on the fact that the story revealed serious mistakes and improper actions inside the government's most important intelligence agency. And those actions, the investigation, and the consequences had all been kept secret from the public. So we advised Bob's family and the government. Again, the officials urged us not to publish, saying that it would further endanger him. Uh, but this time, they could not specifically say why or point to any pending or promising efforts to help free him. So we were acting independently. Uh, the Obama administration was not happy. Uh, from the White House, it called our decision to publish highly irresponsible. A White House aide asked us insultingly whether AP editors woke up that morning and decided to kill him. The Washington Post and the New York Times quickly followed with their own versions of the story. Marty Baron, the Post executive editor, said his newspaper had been close to publishing the story itself before the AP did. He said enough time had passed. Remarkably to me, this is still being debated. Uh, we are accountable, uh, but across Washington and in New York, journalists that we respect have criticized us pointedly and still ask us, how could you have done that? The public editor for the Times recently described another request by the government to withhold information. This is what she wrote. Keeping the government's secrets is not the news media's job unless there is a clear, direct, and life-threatening reason to justify it. The real threat to national security is a government operating in secret and accountable to no one, with watchdogs that are too willing to muzzle themselves. So thank you again on behalf of the AP and myself and Matt Apuzo and Adam Goldman.